أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين ثم الصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين I want to take this opportunity once again to welcome you to the continuation of our series on child upbringing in the contemporary Muslim societies. Those of you who were with us in the first lecture, you remember that we gave a wide introduction about this topic. And we are looking at the several dynamics and the several trends which are ongoing within the Muslim societies. We made a promise that this is going to be uh, a series whereby we shall be handling several segments under this topic. Today, bi'ithnillahi ta'ala, allow me to start by looking at the cardinal role of parents in child upbringing. Those of you who are with us last time we made it categorically clear <coughs> that presently there are several players in child upbringing. And there is no way you can skip or you can ignore the role of the parent. We looked at the parent as one of the major key stakeholders in child upbringing. We also mentioned the role of the teacher and we are asking ourselves certain questions. What is the role of the teacher in child upbringing? How do you look at the comparison because between the quality of the teacher today, his moral values among others, and the teacher of the recent, sorry, and the teacher of the previous times. We are also looking at the community itself because those of you who could recall very well, we stressed the role of the community. The children of the previous generations were children of the community. Any elder in the community had the mandate and he had the moral authority to question the moral values of any child in the society. Today, many things have changed and that's why we are here so that we can look at how can we restore that situation and how can we claim that lost glory. And of course, we don't want to forget the role of the environment. Many things have changed from the traditional ancient way of doing things to the contemporary ways of doing things. So inshallah ta'ala today we want to continue from where we stopped by looking at the role of parents in child upbringing. Before we could go deep into this topic, I want to make an introductory statement by saying that the Sharia approach, before Sharia could give you a responsibility, it could start by empowering you, by ensuring that you have the right tools, you have the right qualifications in order to do a certain role that is going to be assigned to you. Actually, that has been the trend in all the Sharia commandments, in all the Sharia obligations. That is why the students of Sharia, you can appreciate the concept of taklif, that concept which comes out of the Quranic verse which says, La yukallifu Allahu nafsan illa wus'aha. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not charge any soul, any human being 
with any obligation or responsibility that is beyond its capacity. It therefore goes without saying that any responsibility that Islam assigns to you, first of all, Islam gives you the, the qualifications, it gives you the tools which can enable you in order to fulfill that assignment, to fulfill that obligation. From that perspective, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decided that you as a parent, you have a role to play in upbringing your child, in shaping the future of the child, his direction, his moral, spiritual values, first of all, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala empowered you with several Sharia guarantees. So before we could look at your responsibility in child upbringing, as a father, as a mother, it is important first of all to appreciate that position which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put you in as a parent. On the basis of that position, you shall be accountable. Because as you know, you cannot charge someone to do something when you have not given him the tools, when you have not empowered him. So Allah wa ta'ala in his wisdom, before assigning the responsibility and the obligation of child upbringing to the parent, first of all, he empowered that parent. Brothers and sisters in Islam, let us look at some of the Sharia guarantees and the Sharia authorities that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave to a parent. First of all, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave the parent the right to ultimate respect and dignity. You know the several verses of the Quran whereby Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instructs the child to be dutiful to the parent. وَقَضَى رَبُّكَ أَلَّا تَعْبُدُوا إِلَّا إِيَّاهُ وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has decided that we are supposed to be dutiful to our parents. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decided that we should not worship anything apart from him. And what comes next is being dutiful, paying a lot of respect to our parents. That respect that Allah has given the parent which actually is coming immediately after the commandment to obey Allah and to worship him, it carries a lot of meaning. It means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has empowered you as a parent. He has given you that kind of respect. He has commanded the child to pay maximum respect to you so that you can leverage on that in order to do your role as a person who is supposed to shape the moral and the spiritual direction of that child. It is also from the same perspective that you find out that <laughs> disobedience of a parent is one of the grave sins in Islam. In one of the authentic ahadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he was asked about the grave sins, he said, walidain," and disrespecting, disobeying the parents. Have you ever been there as a parent and asked yourself, why Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala has given you that kind of authority, that kind of ultimate Garant, uh, that kind of ultimate respect, Allah gives you that so that you can have enough power. You can have enough and necessary facilities and tools so that you can carry out your responsibility as a parent. By the way, to expound more on this first guarantee that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given the parent 
you find out that one of the scholars by names of Faus, Faus says, Mina Sunna and Yuwakar Arba'a. It is among the Sunnah, it is among the good things, it is among the traditions of Muslims that four people should be respected unconditionally. They should be respected ultimately. The first person in the category of four, number one is Al Walid, that is the parent. In other words, the parent, by mere fact that through you, a life came to this universe, you deserve the respect. The second is a sheikh, that is an old person. That is why, by the way, you could see that the old people, the elders council, the opinion leaders, they are supposed to be respected because they have a role to play in our communities and in our societies. The third is a sultan, that is the leader, the authority. And that's why you see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded us to obey our leaders. Obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first, obey the commandments of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and obey the commandments of those in charge. That is the authority. The reason why the authority must also be obeyed, because it is expected that this kind of authority is acting in the best interest of the society. Then the fourth is al-alim, that is the scholar. The scholar, scholars in our faith are also supposed to be respected because of what we said in our previous episode, whereby one of the poets said, Qum lil mu'allimi wa tabjila, stand up in recognition of the teacher, in recognition of the scholar, and pay him maximum respect. Kaad al mu'allimu an yakuna rasula, because the teacher, the instructor, the facilitator, the resource person, was almost closer to the status of the prophets and messengers alayhi salatu wassalam, alayhi salatu wassalam. Therefore, the first guarantee, the first authority that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has accorded to you as a parent is that right to respect. Whether you are rich or not, you deserve that respect. But behind that respect, it is the requirement that once you are respected, then you must fulfill your role as a parent. And one of the number one roles is to ensure that you do the child upbringing. That is one of the empowerment areas that Islam or Sharia has actually given the parent. The second is, you might not believe that when you go to Islamic criminal law, you will find out that there is a principle that shows the much respect that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given the parent. And behind that actually is to show that you have the authority, you have that kind of immunity so that you can do your role in child upbringing. It is a clear prophetic hadith that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, لا يقتل الوالد بقتل ولده أو لا يقتل الوالد بولده Was the parent kills the child, the parent is not killed in retaliation as qiswas when he has killed his, his child or when he has killed maybe the daughter or the son. Now this sounds strange, but we should be interested in knowing what is the rationale behind this. What is the rationale behind this kind of immunity? To an extent that Sharia, uh, you know, Sharia happens to give the parent such a position that even when the parent kills his son, his daughter, her son, her daughter, that parent is not killed under the law of retaliation or under the law of Kiswas. Our noble scholars, 
while looking at this hadith because I don't want the audience to abuse this hadith, to misuse it, especially today when we see the wrangles, the misunderstandings between the parent and the child to an extent that the parent can act in such an irresponsible and violent manner and takes away the life of the child. That is not the perspective of Islam when Islam was giving you as a parent this kind of immunity. The perspective of Islam when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decided that you shouldn't be killed under the law of retaliation, when you kill the child, our noble land scholars have identified several reasons, but please allow me just to concentrate and emphasize two of them. Point number one, ideally, a parent cannot do something that could harm his child. That is the ideal situation. You all know how merciful, how sympathetic, how caring the parent is towards the child. You know that kind of care, that kind of mercy that the parent always expresses and gives to the child. So under ideal circumstances, uh, circumstances it is even distanced, it is even not imagined that the parent at one moment can kill the child. So it means that if that incident takes place, then we, shall, we must find a very good reason, or we must give this parent what we call a benefit of doubt. Why did this take place? Did it take place by mistake? Was it an intentional murder? Was it murder by mistake or something of that sort? So you could see that kind of guarantee and that kind of respect and immunity that you as the parent, Sharia has given you so that you can enjoy it. So that is one of the reasons. Therefore, the second reason is always to give you a benefit of doubt. Why? As a parent, you have the responsibility of uh, disciplining your child. That is your obligation. So you never know. In the course of exercising your duty, in the, case, in the course of fulfilling your obligation, maybe death might have taken place. Maybe you have beaten this child somewhere without intention or by mistake. And that is why the Sharia gives you that kind of guarantee. So that guarantee is given to you so that you know that you have that kind of immunity. And once you have this kind of immunity, then you are a free person to do your expected roles. Just to give you a more explanation on that, in judiciary, according to the Islamic judicial system, when a judicial officer, when the judge makes a mistake in exercising his duty as a judge, and maybe he appropriates a certain right to a person who is not the rightful person, that judge is immune, is protected. It is not to give the judges the leeway, the absolute authority and freedom so that they can abuse that kind of immunity. No, that's not the intention. The intention is to put the judge in such a safe, comfortable position so that he can exercise all his powers, all his understanding, all his reasoning in order to arrive at justice. So, in the same way, that is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given the immunity to the parent. Now, having seen that, that Allah wa ta'ala has given the parent that such kind of immunity, we also need to look at yet another component which gives you as a parent so much power, which gives you that kind of guarantee that you should carry out your responsibility. My dear parent, my fellow parents, have you ever thought about the rationale behind the natural relationship that you enjoy with that child? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has decided that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has decided that you have that natural relationship between you and your child. 
You are joined with that child or you are tied with that child with that blood relationship. What does that blood relationship bring about? It brings about the strong emotional attachment. You know how closer we are to our children. You know how dear we are because this is our child. And you know how the child is so closer to you as a parent. Now, when you go to the Quran and you try to look at that natural relationship, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given it several, uh, several examples or several comparisons. At one moment, in Surah to Al Imran, that is chapter 3, verse 14, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was speaking about the relationship between the parent and the child, that blood relationship, Allah said, Zuyina lin nas, hubbu shahawat, min al nisa, wal banin, wal qanafir al muqanfarat min al dhahbi wal fidda, wal khayri al musawwamat wal anami wal harf, thalika mata'u al hayati dunya. Wallahu indahu husnul ma'ab. When Allah was talking about the relationship between the parent and the child, He brought that natural relationship, that natural attachment between you and the child. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala confirmed by saying that men are naturally tempted by the law or by inclining towards women, towards children towards treasures, the gold, the silver, the horses of mark, the cattle, the plantations, among others. Then Allah says that, ذَلِكَ مَتَاعُ الْحَيَاةِ dunya. Those are enjoyments in this life of this world. وَاللَّهُ عِنْدَهُ حُسْنُ الْمَآبِ And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has the best return. What is the implication of that similitude? What is the implication of that comparison? Why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings out that kind of relationship between the blood relationship between you, that kind of emotional, physical blood attachment between you and the child? There are several implications. Number one, you need to ask yourself as a parent that in case of conflict between that love that you have to the parent, sorry, that love that you have towards the child, and fulfilling your obligation for child upbringing, which of the two takes precedent? What do I mean be, with this question? You are the parent, and you are living in such a contemporary society whereby you have some demands, and those demands sometimes dictated that you should leave that responsibility of child upbringing. So in case of conflict, that you cannot uphold those demands, that you cannot take on those demands, at the same time do your role as the parent, which of the two take precedent? We are living at a time whereby we have seen actually some parents leaving their children to go for greener pastures. And they are not worried at all because what is actually driving them is the material gain at the expense of their role of upbringing. Yes, I understand. In certain circumstances, you are forced because also if you don't work hard, you cannot bring food to the table. It means that you cannot fulfill your obligation because you are supposed to provide for this child. But I'm talking about those situations whereby you see that you are not in such a necessity. You are not under such force, uh, such coercive means or coercive situations. But you leave your child there in the name of uh, collecting or gathering a lot of money. How do you look at that responsibility? How dare that you forgot that emotional attachment that blood relationship that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talked about that you are supposed to be closer, you are supposed to be dear, you are supposed to be so loving to your child, and you forget and ignore all that in the name of acquiring a lot of uh, wealth. What about the situations that we have seen 
whereby some parents have forgotten about that blood relationship and attachment and they went ahead to do to carry out some gruesome activities some gruesome acts to an extent of sacrificing their children in the name of uh, wealth accumulation because the so-called spirits and ghosts have dictated such to them this is one of the issues that you must think about that after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made that strong relationship between you and the child because of the world the gains you turn against this very child and you take away his life or her life how are you going to answer this before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you contributed to the termination of a life which were actually one of the reasons why this child, why this life came to this uh, material world. On the positive note, we are also happy to mention that there are those parents who have understood this relationship, who have appreciated their role and they have accepted to suffer they have accepted to earn what is little so that they can concentrate on that role of child upbringing. I have several examples of some mothers especially who have suspended their going out for work and they say that no, my children are still minors. My children want to see me in their image, in their, in their eyes. My children want to see me to carry out my role because as I get away from home, I don't know what kind of child upbringing they are going to have. So such mothers are so much appreciated. Those mothers who have persevered, those mothers who have been patient in order to be there to see that this child comes out in the best way, commanding such good spiritual and moral values. Also, we have seen that this phenomenon of leaving our children home in the name of going out so that we can work, so that we can accumulate a lot of wealth. Some people actually think that this is the Western style, which is actually not. Because when you go at and look at the traditional style of people in the developed world, you might be surprised to find out that both parents cannot leave home at the same time. In their case, it's a division of labor. If the father stays, the mother can go out. If the mother is going out, the father has to stay so that they can foresee, so that they can mon monitor, so that they can have the hands on when this child is being brought in this kind of uh, the family. So that is one of the major implications that we must think about when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about that natural relationship between us and our children. Also, another implication that we as parents must learn out of that natural relationship is, we have seen in some situation whereby that natural relationship has actually misled some of us. There is too much love that we show our children to an extent that this leads us into fitna. And that's why Quran in Surah that is Quran, uh, uh, that, that, that is uh, verse number 15, Surah Tagabun, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Innama amwalukum wa awladukum fitna, wallahu indahu ajrun azim. Verily, your wealth and your children are a test to you. They might be a fitna to you. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has the biggest reward. So the issue that we need to think about here is that if you give your child the best, no doubt that that child is going to be a source of blessing, is going to be qurratu ayni lak, is going to be a source of your calmness, a source of your peace of mind, among others. But if you do not appreciate that natural relationship, you abuse it, you misuse it, and you do not utilize it, your child is likely to turn into fitna. The kind of continuous fitna that throughout your life shall be cursing your, that child 
not knowing that actually it is you who didn't carry out your role. We want to end this episode by looking at the second comparison that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to the parents, between the parents and the children. The other comparison which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given or has brought in the Quran, or the similitude that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought in the Quran, he says, Al wal banun zinatul hayati dunya. Wal baqiyatu salihat khayrun inda rabbika thawaban wa khayrun amala. Surah Al Kahf, verse number 46. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the relationship of the parent and the child, he brings that by comparison with wealth. Al mal wal banun, the wealth and the children. Zina tul hayati dunya. There is no doubt that these are the blessings, these are the ornaments, these are the things that we want a lot in this world life. So when you see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comparing the wealth and comparing the children in terms of the way how people love the wealth, love the children, it should also give you some kind of a lesson. What are some of the lessons that we must learn out of that verse? We are first in some situations whereby you see that there is a certain clash between the love that you have for the child and also the love for the wealth. That one we have actually just talked about. By the way, another way how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has talked about our love for children you find in Surah Al-Furqan, where Allah says, وَالَّذِينَ يَقُولُونَ رَبَّنَا هَبْلَنَا مِنْ أَزْوَاجِنَا وَذُرِّيَّاتِنَا قُرَّةَ آيٌ وَجَعَلْنَا لِلْمُتَّقِينَ إِمَامًا When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is guiding us on the best prayers that we should make, the believers always ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant them the blessing of the spouses and the offspring that the children so what should we learn out of that? What we learn out of that is that, you know that naturally we love our spouses, as also naturally we love our children. Sometimes you find a conflict of the two whom you should you love most. Also, we have seen certain situations whereby you were too much love for the wife or for the husband has actually compromised on, compromised on your effort to give this child the best of the upbringing. We have seen some situations whereby your child is growing up and is indisciplined. He is having such immoral characters, but you don't want to caution, actually you fear to caution that child in the name of fearing the mother. You know, the mother does not want me to comment on the hairstyle of this child. You know, the mother does not want to comment about how this child puts on. Sometimes I have seen that. The father is interested, for instance, in seeing the decency in the child dress code. But the mother has decided that this young child, especially the daughters, she's putting on such a tight jean. She's putting on such, you know, clothes which are tight, clothes which are transparent, and the parent actually fears to caution in the name of, I don't want to annoy my spouse. I don't want to annoy my husband. I don't want to annoy my wife. We have also seen situations. The young generation today does not have any limit. At which time do the children come in? At what time do they get out? The children as early as 13, as early as 15, they are free to get out at any time. And they can come back home at any time. And you find out that the parent cannot caution on such characters, on such discipline, because he's fearing that you know, the mother wants it that way. We have also seen some situations whereby your children are moving in company of bad people. But you don't want to caution them, forgetting that this is your responsibility in the name of, I don't want to annoy my wife. So brothers and sisters in Islam, this is something that we must take care of 
when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the way how we love our spouses and even the way how we love our children. So as we are summing up, we have also seen situations whereby some parents actually, they neglect their children because they are giving a lot of love to the spouses. How many situations that you have seen whereby children are suffering, children are under some kind of violence, some kind of neglect, simply because the wife at home does not want that kind of a child, especially those children who are living in homes with their stepdads or with their stepmoms. You find that child being neglected, being ignored, such a child passing through a lot of suffering because the madam at home does not want the parent, does not want the father to extend anything good to that kind of a child. And that's why you have seen several stories that have come to the media whereby you see that some children are being malnourished and that child is living in a home whereby there is a mother, there is a father. In many cases, that child is living with a stepmother who is not concerned about the welfare of that child. And the father, instead of exercising his authority, as the father, instead of exercising his duty, his role to provide for this child, he sees everything normal in the fear that he does not want to annoy this kind of uh, a spouse. I want to end this episode by showing you how really Islam protected the child. How Islam protected the child coming out of the fact that this is your child, this is your blood, and therefore there shouldn't be any situation that should make you to ignore your responsibility as a, as a parent. As a parent, you must know that you are responsible, you are accountable before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Here is a story, and this story is only is captured in the books of Islamic criminal law under the heading Qatlul Jama'a Bil Wahida that a group of people can actually be killed in retaliation when they take away one life. That one actually comes from the Quranic verse which is well known that Waman You know that verse in Surah Al Maida whereby Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says Min ajli dhalika katabna ala bani Israel Annahu man katala nafsan bighayri nafsin aw fasadin fil ardi faka anna ma katala nasa jami'a Any person who terminates just one life, he is taken as a person who has terminated the life of the entire humanity. In the books of Islamic criminal law, they always bring that kind of mas'ala, qatlul jama'a bil wahid, that in some situation the Islamic judiciary can order for the killing of a group because of only killing or terminating one life. I want to bring this story to show the parents that we must care about our children. We shouldn't leave our children in the hands of our spouses, thinking that the spouses are actually going to take good care of them, especially when these spouses are step uh, parents to these children. It is reported that Annamuraatan biswana'a ghaba anha zawjaha. Ghaba anha zawjuha. It is reported that a woman who was living in Sana'a, Sana'a is the capital city of Yemen, her husband went away. Her husband went away. Wataraka fi hujriha ibn allahu min ghayriha. When this father was living, or when this husband was living, he left behind in the hands of this woman, a young child. That child was a child of this husband, but not a child of this wife. In other words, this wife was a stepmother to this child. 
What happened? That child, yuqalu lahu aswil. His name was called aswil. When the husband has gone away, leaving this child in the hands of the stepmother, فَاتَّخَذَتِ الْمَرْأَ بَعْدَ زَوْجِهَا خَلِيلًا When the woman know, knew that after all my husband has gone to such a destination and is going to spend some good time, she fell in love with a certain man. Of course, after falling into love, they had to involve and engage themselves into sexual activities unlawfully. Now that this had taken place, فَقَالَتْ لَهُ This kind of sexual activity took place, it seems that the child noticed this. And this woman and her man feared that maybe this child is going to report. فَقَالَتْ لَهُ So this woman tells this man with whom she had fallen into love, إن هذا الغلام يفضحنا فقتله. This child is going to report our case. Therefore, the best solution is to kill this child. فأبا. It seems that this man had some content of iman, and he said, "I cannot do such. After all, he had already landed into a sin. Then he cannot go for another grave sin." of killing this innocent soul. So this man refused. When this man refused to kill the child, the woman said that since you have refused, then I'm no longer going to have sexual intercourse with you anymore. When the man heard about that, he succumbed to the pressure of this woman. What they did is that they conspired, this woman, the man who is with her in this relationship, and they also got another man who assisted them, and even the servant in that home, the three conspired, and they killed this innocent child. Remember that this child was left behind, in the hands of the stepmother. After killing the child, the hadith continues. After that, they started cutting this child into pieces. They put her, they put these pieces into a container, and after putting this into a container, they threw it into a certain pit or a certain well which was abandoned, which was no longer having any water in it. Now, having destroyed that kind of evidence, and they have killed this kind of a child, now time came that this man came back and asked about where the whereabouts of the child. And this woman could not give some good answers. So what happened is that, of course, an investigation was taken, and at the end of the day, this man had to confess that it is us, it is we actually who killed this child. This was the first incident of that nature to take place in Yemen. It was so strange that even the judge of Yemen did not know what to do. What did the judge do? The judge by then was known as Ya'la. فَقَتَبَ Ya'la وَهُوَ يَأُمَئِذٍ أَمِيرٌ بِشَأَنِهِمْ إِلَىٰ عُمَرٍ Because Ya'la the judge was so surprised and astonished with this kind of event, what he had to do was to write a letter to Umar. Umar was in Medina. He asked him, what should I do? A group of around three to four people have conspired to kill this child. When Umar radiallahu anhu received the letter, he replied to them and said that you should parade all the four, all the five, any person who took active role in the killing of this child and you should kill all of them. 
Umar made a statement and said, Wallahi, I swear by the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, law anna ahla sana'a, if all the dwellers, the residents of the city of Sana'a, ishtaraku fi qatlihi, if all of them, the residents of Sana'a, participated in the killing of this child, laqataltuhum ajma'in, I would have killed all of them. What lessons do we pick out of that? In many situations as parents, we happen to distance ourselves and we leave our responsibility of taking care of the children. Upbringing can only be done when the child is alive. In many cases, we happen actually to go and attend to other businesses and we are not sure about the welfare, the safety and the security of our children. So it's a big lesson that your primary role, your primary obligation is to take care of this child, his security, his safety, his well-being and his welfare. Those issues must be primary before you could think about other things. It also gives us a lesson that sometimes we leave our children in the hands of people we trust, thinking that actually they can do the role only to find out that they do betray us. So with this, I want to come to the end of this episode, and inshallah ta'ala in our next episode, we shall be looking at the role of the parent in laying the foundation of aqidah for the child. This is where we shall see that the aqidah of the children was naturally laid down by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and our role as a parent, our roles as parent, is to see that we support that aqidah by making sure that our children grow in such a good environment that helps them to understand Allah and also to fulfill the obligations of their religion. Aqulu qawli hadha, wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.